What's up, y'all? It's me here, Michael Franti, and welcome to this week's edition of the Stay Human Podcast. I've been looking forward to having this guy on the show for about six weeks when I first heard he was coming on, and I did a deep dive in everything he's done. Uh, but before we get into it, man, I just got to say that I I I use your product, <laughs> and I'll talk more about that as, as we get into it. Um, but our guest today on the Stay Human show, which is uh, presented today today by Gibson Guitars. Uh, uh, he founded the antioxidant beverage company Buy in his basement in 2009 and quickly built it into the fastest growing brand in the industry. And with Buy, he led a bevolution against giant soda, sugary, you know, crazy ass soft drink companies by delivering a great tasting drink without mounds of that nasty sugar and artificial ingredients. And the Dr. Pepper Snapple group snapped them up uh, by in 2017 for a tidy $1.7 billion. And now he is continuing his bevolution with Crook and Marker, the world's first fully USDA organic alcohol beverage portfolio. And Crook and, Marcher, Crook and Marker uh, launched nationally in early 2019 and is now a leading brand in the quote unquote, better for you, alcoholic beverage category, achieving triple digit sales growth while rapidly expanding its roster of major retail partners. So please welcome to the show, entrepreneur and now author of the new book, Base Mentality, Ben Weiss. What's up, Ben? Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the kind words. Ah, uh, man, I'm super, super stoked to, to have you because, you know, uh, I got to say, when Buy First came out, I'm somebody who has battled sugar addiction my pretty much my entire life. And as an adult, there was I don't know, maybe like about 12, 13 years ago, I decided to stop drinking sugary soft drinks. And I, I went to, you know, sparkling water. I went to a, a, everything I could, you know, juices until I found out that how much, you know, when you, when you're just juicing juices, you're just pulling the sugar out of the, out of the fruit. And, and, and there's a lot of, a lot of calories there too. And, and so when buy came along and I tried it on tour, like we were in a truck stop somewhere and I was like, what is this? It's like I can't even remember. It was like blueberry <laughs> acai, something yeah, like yeah. It sounded like really good to me. And I got it, and I was like, "Damn, this shit is good, man!" And I, I, I remember going back in and, and buying some for the guys in the band and everybody trying it. And then it replaced um, all the other stuff that we had on our rider, and we yeah. we went went full full in on it, and and it became a part of our tour experience, and and. So, man, I just first of all want to just say thank you for for creating an alternative to to um, you know sugary stuff. Beverages just kind of play a, a very specific role in people's lives. It's intimate, you know. You're ingesting it often. You're ingesting it multiple times a day. So, if you think about that, there, you, you have to have a relationship with that drink, and that drink off, often speaks to you know your lifestyle so it you know it brings like-minded people and i'd like maybe we are like-minded which is pretty cool too uh together and and I, that's that's the beauty of beverage is that it can find people like that and connect them you know my wife and i have a saying it's uh and it's kind of our, our one of our mottos here at our hotel and it's 100 percent healthy 90 percent of the time and <laughs> you got to have that 10% in your yeah, life, right? You got to have that 10% in your life. And that's what the, that's where the living is, you know? And that's the thing is uh, uh, when I was trying to, to kick the sugary soft drink habit, it was like, I missed the, the, so um, that, that the, the is flavor. A great, yeah. That's I a missed great the flavor. Point. Because you know, usually and you guys did flavor. it. Yeah. yeah. Usually, Michael, to get flavor, you have to give up and you have to compromise. And that's what I think made Buy so special is that it can play that role in your life, especially how we ultimately innovated into all these different types of beverages. Because I like to say we, we stumbled upon the answer to the diet dilemma. We figured out how to make five calories really good without sacrificing flavor and using artificial sweeteners. 
And when we did that, we just innovated it across different platforms. We did a tea, we did lemonades, we did enhanced waters, we did bubbles. And, and what we were doing in creating that innovation is we were giving people the opportunity to rethink what they drink. But we were also, as I come to learn, we were really stressing the relationship with the distributor. And the thing is with beverage, in order to disrupt the beverage industry, you almost have to align with the very people that you're looking to disrupt, right? So you often have to wind up on a Coke truck, a Pepsi truck, or in our case, a Dr. Pepper Snapple truck. And those are the three route to markets that'll get you mass availability. Yeah. So it's kind of like this catch 22 where you're, you're working alongside them, but you're really trying to take them down. And, I, and that's where we, we find the bevolution. You know, it's, um, yeah. it's a fight against the same partners that, that you need in order to get to the consumer. Yeah. Um, and that's where a lot of great brands go to die because they don't know how to build distribution equity. So right. it, at the end of the day, Michael, it's way more than having a, a product that tastes good and looks good on a shelf. Um, or in a Super Bowl commercial, or on a billboard. You know, it's all about building this equity, and you know, fighting uh, for shelf space when, quite frankly, they own other brands that they'd rather give it to. Yeah. yeah. But you had said something earlier that that I think is important. I want to just t touch on. You had said that you know you you gave up sugar maybe 15 years ago, and the reality yeah. is we're all trained from a very young age to eat sugar. Right. Like, yeah, you do something good. You get a piece of candy. You have a birthday, you have a birthday cake. And listen, the best I love day sugar. of the year is Halloween, you know, <laughs> uh, Halloween's the best. And, and you know what? I love the 10 percent, that little 10 percent you're talking yeah. about, because that's when you do enjoy that. And listen, I am. I love sugar. I just want to be able to enjoy my sugar elsewhere. So yeah. in, I need to find my 10 percent. So what what's ironic is that beverages in the U.S., beverages comprise 70 percent of the sugar consumption it comes from beverages. Wow. Think about that for a second. So yeah. if you could eliminate sugar from that part of your diet and not sacrifice by just drinking a seltzer with a little bit of flavor, but actually yeah. having big flavor, not consuming the sugar, well, then go have a piece of birthday cake. I, you know, I'm not like a guy yeah. who says don't eat sugar. Uh, I'm just yeah. a guy that says you don't have to drink sugar. Yeah. You don't and have sugar to drink in a beverage. Calories. Yeah. Drinking your calories is tough because it's liquid candy. So it, it yeah. goes right into your bloodstream. It's often the worst type of sugar, which is high fructose corn syrup. So uh, you kind of want to avoid it at all costs. And in 2017, I think it was the first year, Michael, where consumers drank more water than they did soda. That was the first time that's wow. ever happened. Wow. So they're aware of it. There's a movement. We yeah. were just leading it with big, bold flavor. That's awesome. I want to know about where this, this fight in you came from, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just want to learn about your life. So where, where did you grow up and what was your family like? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in New York and I'm a borough boy. I, I grew up in Staten Island. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I went to college in Boston. My parents moved to California. So I've been removed from Staten Island for a while, but that's, those are my roots. Um, you know, I come from, you know, middle class family um, where the mom was the breadwinner because my parents okay. got divorced when I was seven. So I think my mother being a working mom really influenced me. Um, uh -huh. And well, tell me about that. Mom, did you dad, have other brothers and sisters too in the house? I, yeah, I have a, uh, a sister, Candice, right. who's, a, who's a year and a half older than me. Um, but, you know, you, you say, where'd the fight come from? And it's a great question. It really is because I'm not by, by nature an angry guy, um, yeah. <laughs> but, I was an ang but I'm an angry CEO. Um, and, and I know how to channel that anger. Because I had a father uh, who, before my parents got divorced, there was a lot of anger that came yeah. out of him. He did not know how to control his anger. And, mm -hmm. and often he lashed out at the very people he loved the most. And I, I think- How, I, how I, early in your life do you remember that? Oh, I remember fighting as a, as a very big part of my growing up. And yeah. it's funny because my mother's not a fighter. Like she's not a yeah. yeller as, at all. It came from that direction, it came from my father. Yeah. Um, so it was always part of the, the, the household just because he's, yeah. he was a bit of a broken man. Um, in, mm -hmm. he was a good guy. He just did, he didn't know how to control that emotion. What and, was his, uh, what, what did he do? What was his, you say he was broken. What was yeah, his no, no. experience? So he, he, he gave me all of my creativity. He was a very creative guy. He is, he owned a, an advertising agency. Um, he was a, a very creative guy, a very bad businessman, uh, who, uh, you know, ultimately just, just 
had a modest business. Um, and, and in part, it was these personality flaws that I talked about that kind of found their way into business as well. It was just mm-hmm. tough. It was a tough environment to be around. Uh, yeah. Extremely creative guy, though. And I thank him for that. And, and not a bad guy. You know, he's the type of guy who, Michael, I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but it, if he did lash out, he'd also be the guy as you storm out of his office, you'd see him in the window kind of crying because of what yeah. he did. Like, so yeah. he knew he was doing wrong as he was doing, he just couldn't control it. And yeah. it wasn't a physical thing. It was just a, a bad way of expressing himself. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, you know, was a part of my life for a while. He had passed away. Um, and I was really raised by my mom and my stepdad, Ray, who has played a critical role in my life. And that's, that fighting completely went away. It was not part of my upbringing. Yeah. But getting back to, you know, <clears throat> why I have fight in me, I don't think it's because of him. You know, I don't have that type of fight in me. Yeah. I have a fight. My fight comes specifically in business. I always say every day, like I'm fighting with you, although this isn't a fight. Yeah. Fighting is just mental warfare. Like sparring. I have such, it's sparring. Yeah. It's not yeah. like, you know, it's sparring. And, I, and what, what I'm trying to do is say, I have this really big vision of the future and I'm tethered to it. So good luck trying to convince me. And it's not arrogance. It's just like, you have to be that way. Right. Because yeah. the desire is for entrepreneurs to fail early on. Yeah. And, and I'm just so tethered to it. And I'm now saying either you see what I see, because maybe we're like-minded yeah. Um, and if you don't, I'm trying to convince you of that vision. Yeah. And if you can't be convinced of that vision, I got to I got to push you out. At least the point I was trying to make, Michael, is that, you know, I think being angry benefited me in, in mm-hmm. business. Um, I also think being aware of how you use anger. I think there's an art to being angry. When did that right? come to you? Because, you know, when I was a kid, I, I had a similar situation. I grew up with a really angry dad he was like he had two emotions there was like silence and rage and there wasn't like a whole lot in between he's similar to your dad he was a very creative guy he was very you know intellectual and thoughtful but emotionally he was crippled you know, he just mm-hmm. d- yeah. didn't know how to really. It's actually, it's a great word. That's, that's that's how I would express my my father is just crippled emotionally. Yeah, and so where did this like awareness come for you? Because I remember there was a time when I was in about sixth grade, and I got in this fight in school. Kids used to pick on me all the time because I was like the tallest, skinniest brown kid in a mostly white school, and. Um, there was one time I grabbed, I was in a fight with this guy. I grabbed him by the collar and I started like squeezing his collar and I was going to punch him. And it's something in my head just clicked. Like if I just kept squeezing him, like I could, like he could die. Yeah. You know, and I didn't hit him and I let him go. And it was like, this thing went off in my head. Like, yo, you're going down like a really bad path if you keep doing this. And, and I had to learn to find other outlets. And for me, it was like sports music, arts and stuff like that. Cause school really wasn't my, my bag, you know, but what was it for you that, that kind of set you thinking like, I got to yeah. channel this differently. Unfortunately, I wasn't the tallest kid in the school and I basketball wasn't an option <laughs> for me. Although I have a six, believe it or not, I have a six foot five son who has an amazing ah, three point shot. <laughs> nice. But uh, for me, the, 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 I think, what you experienced is you were very conscious of not being that guy. And I think in my life, I'm, I'm respectful of what that guy has given me, but also conscious of how I use what he's given me because he's given me good and bad, right? That's just yeah. natural. And, yeah. and anger for me uh, has been beneficial because it gives me my edge in business. Mm-hmm. Like it's amazing. Talk what me you through can that. Do how edge. do you talk me through that? How does it show up for I, you on it? Yeah. Oh, I get mad if people don't, if they stand in the way of a good idea. Listen, if the, the idea is bad and I've had bad ideas, don't get me wrong. I, I don't profess to nailing these things. Matter of fact, even my good ideas, you do these pivots along the way to make it a really good idea, but you got to be given that opportunity. And if you stand in my way, I get really, really angry. And that's where I kind of just kind of dig in. And instead of like, when you restrained yourself from hitting somebody, like I don't, my anger is not about, lashing out at people. My anger is like, okay, now I'm digging in and I, you and I are going to go at it. 
in a, in a, in a, in a very salesman like way, I'm going to show yeah. you my vision and, and you're going to either believe it or you're going to say, I don't, I choose not to. And then I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to push you away. I'm going to go, I'm going to go through you. And, yeah. and that's the delicate part that you have to figure out. And it's a really hard, by the way, I didn't know this about me until after I sold by because I was the same guy in every one of my businesses. I just didn't have a $1.7 billion exit at the end of any of them. And yeah. when, when you do that and then life stops, right? So I got fired from Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. I thought I'd still be there and we'd run hard together, but my life stopped. And when it stopped, I had this great luxury of writing this book alongside one of my closest friends, Eric Quinones. And it was almost like therapy. And I gotta be honest with you, I learned a lot about myself and I started to fall in love with myself because I was always the guy that said, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I am not the most creative guy in the room. You know, I've always hired and inspired those people to be alongside me, but I didn't know why, why did it need me? Why did the businesses yeah. need me? I get it, I created it, but why did it need me? And then every time I stepped away, the business faltered. And, and now on the other side of buy, I'm starting a new business and I see it even more, the role that I play as an entrepreneur in that business. And I'm even more sensitive to th- that edge that that is so required to cut through any business that you're trying to disrupt anything that you're trying to disrupt because you know the reason why these brands are behemoths is because they they have a role in society and they've been propped up now as society has evolved right i told you the first mm-hmm. year that people are drinking more water than carbonated soft drinks the yeah. consumers moved right but yeah. you've got these legacy brands that are so propped up giving consumers not what they want and that makes me angry because i want yeah. them out of the way i want just a fair shot in front of that consumer and if they choose me and or if they don't choose me i'll live with those consequences but i don't like the fact that they you sell more snapple iced tea that has 56 grams of sugar than a brand that's on your trucks that tastes better with five calories and one gram of sugar i i, yeah. I can't accept that that's the right thing so what yeah. do I do? I sell it to them. And I never really, that was my intent, but I felt like they needed to be more connected to the business. Cause I, part of me understood the businessman in me said, I get it. You own Snapple. You don't own us. You make more money off of selling them than you do us. It's your brand. So you sell it. Okay. Now you own this great brand. You paid a ton of money for it. And yet I still see a Snapple Cola today that has more Snapple in it than, yeah. than buy and they own the brand. So it just, it, it continues to anger me that the consumer is not getting what they want. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, just, just so folks can hear the base mentality story. Let, let's talk a little bit about how buy was created and where it came from. Uh, I mean, yeah. I've read, it's such a great story. And I'd love to just hear from your own words. Um, so, you know, my journey in beverage really started, I say it in the book, I really believe it was those kisses at the end of the night my mother gave me with coffee on her breath. Uh, <laughs> that really, that really left an emotional imprint. I've had those, man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, they got divorced and then she started dating and I was just a very nervous seven-year-old mommy's boy. Uh, and I'd wait up, uh, at the front window for her to get home because I was just, I just wanted her to get home. And yeah. when I saw those headlights come around the corner, I ran into bed and I faked like I was sleeping and she'd invariably come up and give me a kiss goodnight, which I do to my daughter every, every day now. Yeah. Um, and it was that because I was awake when she did it and I'd smell that coffee as she had gone out for dinner and had a cup of coffee. And I was like, that was for me, that was safe, right? That, was, that meant yeah. she was back. So I think there was this emotional connection with coffee and that my career just started out in coffee and it stayed in and around coffee. I was always involved in coffee. I didn't grow up saying, oh, I want to be in coffee or I want to, you know, start a bevolution or quite frankly, or I want to take sugar off the streets. That was not in me. What was in me was always I was an entrepreneur from day one. As a kid, I always, you know, created things and inspired people in my own. What was your first thing? What was your first business? My, my mother will tell me, will tell you that I had a pencil club as a kid. I, I do not recall doing that. I'm not saying it didn't happen uh, <laughs> because those, those things are just kind of intuitive to me. But my, my first business out of college, I just wanted to open up a coffee bar. 
And you got to remember, this is when coffee was starting to come on the scene with Starbucks. It was a big, you know, revolution of its own, that specialty yeah. coffee revolution. And it was a great industry, a lot of growth. And, you know, I just wanted to open up a coffee bar out of college. Yeah. And one thing led to another that never transpired. So, uh, you know, I was just that guy riding that city bus back from New York to New Jersey every day. I was working at my dad's little advertising agency at the time. And, you know, I had all this coffee knowledge because I had studied it. I had traveled abroad to just in Europe, understand the coffee culture. And I just wanted to bring it back here, but nobody was going to invest in it. So, uh, I was doing something else. And, and then I just passed a big movie theater as the bus was going by. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is back in 92, 34, something like that. And, uh, I was like, in any given weekend, there's a lot of people in that movie theater and they don't drink coffee there. So I took my coffee yeah. knowledge and I said, let's go make a coffee kind of uh, kiosk in movie theaters. And I did that. And it seems like a very novel idea. You know, I was a 22 year old at the time. Um, and I traveled all over the country with this vision of what this can be. I'd go to all these movie houses and try to sell them on it. And they all said the same thing, Michael. They were like, all right, great idea, but you know, who are you? What's brute? I called it brute awakening. He goes, what's brute awakening? And I got Mars and Coke and Pepsi in my waiting room. You know, nice idea. Yeah. Except I went to one called National Movement who said the same exact thing, but then he said, go get a brand. If you get a brand, maybe I'll do something. And I went back to my dad who was doing point of purchase for alcohol. And one of the alcohols that, that were, he was working with was uh, Godiva liqueur. Okay. And I, it hit me because he had got one of those little Godiva mailers and, in, in, you know, monthly mailers. And I was just thumbing through it. I'm like, they're just coming out with a coffee. That's, that's my brand. So I was able to get a meeting with Godiva as a 22 year old. And I turned Brute Awakening, this thing called Cafe Cinema, which was very generic, and into a, the Godiva Theater Cafe. And that was really my, my first uh, invention, if you will, and, and business that actually generated some money. Um, and that was a good feeling. It was a good feeling yeah. to see what ultimately became a display that sat in all these movie theaters and people drinking coffee and these little premium chocolates. And I'm like, wow, that was just a, it was just a thought in my head one day and it's actually happening. And that was intoxicating to see an idea actually commercialized like that, even on a small scale. I mean, we had a hundred theaters, but I lived in those theaters. I mean, I lived in them to make sure that they were successful. And I was just, I knew, I knew I was, this is who I was. And, you know, every business thereafter, and there've been a number of both successes and failures, I always thought was going to be as big as buy ultimately became. Yeah. And they became my, my, my obsessions. Every one of them became my obsessions. Every one of your businesses has become your obsession. And how does that play out for you? You know, um, is it something that you just, you, you get, you dive in 110% and you just can't sleep. You're just, you live and breathe it until it comes to life. Or talk me through that. Yeah. I, Michael, I, I, I'm like a dog on a bone with, with these businesses uh, to a fault. You know, some of these, I probably should have left a lot sooner than I did. Uh, <laughs> but I guess that's also what makes me unique is that I'm, I am unequivocally, I'm, I'm not afraid to fail in these businesses. Um, yeah. and, and they take time and you've got to find your pivots along the way, uh, because they don't come out, you know, perfect. So mm -hmm. I'm a little, I'm, I like to say I'm patiently persistent. Um, yeah. and, and it creates this obsession. It really does. And I think yeah. that's kind of the job of the entrepreneur is to be obsessed with it in an authentic way, in a believable yeah. way, right? Because if it's just an unreal expectation for the business, then you're leading others down a path that probably isn't fair to take them down. Um, yeah. So I find the obsessions in them and I just kind of chase it and I, I stay tethered to them. I have a friend who I was talking to the other day who's just starting a business and said to me, you know, I'm gonna give this like two months and if it doesn't work after two months, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <I was like, laughs> isn't that uh, great? Don't you wish you could do that with like, with kids? I mean, in two months, yeah. if the kid doesn't, you know, stops crying, I'll, I'll keep it. Yeah. <laughs> and these, these, these brands come out unhappy. I mean, they come out crying and, you know, it's just like a baby. You got to nurture them. And how could you put a time frame on it? Now, yeah. listen, economics come into play and maybe you only have two months of capital. Maybe yeah. you only have two months of vacation. And they think that in a vacation, they could change their lives. Um, 
because most people are unhappy in their jobs. And they think that if there's an opportunity to get out, entrepreneurism feels like an opportunity to get out of a day job, but most often they're just creating a very expensive job for themselves, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, being tethered to it in an authentic way um, and, and being obsessed with these, with these ideas is, is critical. And you can't put a time frame against that. So tell me about base mentality and how that is, you know, connected to just how you're describing, how you're just starting from these seeds of ideas and then transforming them into something that becomes tangible. It's, you know, it's a mentality that we were able to capture through my personality uh, and my experience as being an entrepreneur, not just by obviously culminating with by, but I think I've said this before. I mean, I'm the same guy that I was in all of my businesses. I was as obsessed with all of them as I was with buy. And I've created this mentality that kind of ushers me through the process, not always to success, you know? And I think that's part of the journey of being an entrepreneur is, like I said, being okay if failure is the outcome. Uh, I've learned more from my failures than I have from my successes. Um, and that mentality is what I look to, you know, evaluate in an entrepreneur and then kind of guide them. And it's often not about the idea because the idea is either good or bad, commercially viable or not. And it's what you do in that first year when no one's looking to make it commercially viable or better. Um, and that's their, that's their responsibility. It's not, my, I'm not a, a brand whisperer. I don't pretend to know the next big brand, especially quite frankly, outside of beverage. I'm kind of myopic, if you will. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really good at beverage, but you know, so I don't, try to comment or impart my feelings on their product simply because I don't even know if they know their product yet. A lot of people get smitten with the ideas like, Oh, I can uh, make something look good and, and find its role and relevance. But that takes time. That takes way more than two months. And that's their journey. I just kind of apply these, these, uh, these base mentalities to their journey and give them some guidance along the way because there's a graveyard of great ideas. There's a graveyard of, of good entrepreneurs who just were not prepared for the journey. Yeah. Well, tell me about the, the guidelines or the rules of base mentality. <laughs> well, there's certainly not rules. I mean, they're just, and as, if you read, as you read the book, you'll see that they're just, you know, each book is a story along my journey and the base mentality kind of encapsulates it with, with a lesson learned. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's very much not a how to book. I don't have the how to's, on getting a brand from, from a basement to a $1.7 billion exit. Uh, I can tell you it starts with having a plan and that plan is the responsibility of the entrepreneur to not just stay uh, focused on creating the idea, but understanding you're gonna be on a journey that's, you know, in our case, it was uh, nine years and, or eight years and that was a rocket ship, uh, but it was eight years of not getting paid, you know, and then maybe getting underpaid for a couple of years at the end. Um, and it's all sacrifices along the way. So you better be tethered to something that's realistic, especially if you're going to ask others to do the same thing alongside you. But I think the beauty of it, and I think it's told in the book is that when you can dream alongside people you truly love and inspire them to all be like-minded in what you see and, and own it for themselves, that vision, there's nothing more beautiful in business. It's like a it's like a ballet, right? It just mm. comes together uh, where your vision, your audacious vision and all the hard work kind of seamlessly happen. Uh, that's what you chase as an entrepreneur. You know, I can't give you lessons to, to do that other than you gotta be patiently persistent. You gotta be realistic. You gotta be realistic with your brand, right? You gotta say, you know, are the vitals of this brand what I thought they were? Are they healthy? And if not, what do I have to do to make them healthy? Or is it a kind of a lost cause? And I've had lost causes in my, you know, career. There's no question. And I think about one of them and anyway, I just didn't even use the product. And if I, if you don't use your product, you're not authentically tethered yeah. to it. So, I mean, there are signs and signals. I often speak to entrepreneurs who are just kind of getting started and it's more of preparation, but you know, there are situations where you look at an entrepreneur and they're already on their journey and you see that uh, certain things of that journey have kind of broken and some of them are beyond, beyond repair and some of them, you know, just kind of make your pivots. Yeah. Hope you don't run out of money. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you started um, Crook and Marker, were you thinking, man, I, I got to 
I, I don't, I, you know, I sold this other company for 1.7 billion. That ain't enough money. <laughs> or were you thinking, God, I just love to do this. Like, let's go back to the basement and find that seed. Like, what's the next seed for me? What's is it? What's the yeah. drive for you to do something? And do you I feel? Mean, do you like, feel yeah. when you're doing Crook and Marker now? Do you feel the same way that you did when you were starting? So it's a great question. And Michael, maybe you and I know each other for all, you know, 30 minutes. So, uh, but yet I think we're very, we're very like-minded. So I hope you understand or know the answer to this is it's never, ever about the money. Now money plays into it because you're often borrowing a lot of it from either a bank or, or people, you know, or, or people you don't know. And, and it becomes about money. And if you don't think about the money, you're being irresponsible in the game. Mm. So I'm not gonna discount the money, but there's only so much money one person can have. So it's definitely not about, you know, uh, you know, I see some celebrities today that are trying to shape themselves as a billionaire and they're just trying to collect all these reasons why they are on Forbes billionaire yeah. list. And it's a, it's a race to get on that list. For me, I don't care about any of that. To me, it's a, it's about the journey. I know that sounds a little hokey, uh, but if you were here, Michael, and you understood that after this conversation, I'm going back down literally into the basement to uh, continue to build out the next big idea. It's just who, I'm, who I am. I'm actually, without being tethered to a big idea, I'm just not as fun to be around. You know, I'm better, I'm better if yeah. part of me is in the future. Uh, I've kind of proven that I could affect people's lives in that regard, but I'm also just, I'm, I'm a bit healthier in that regard. Uh, I'm a better, I think I'm a better parent. I think I'm a better husband uh, because I stay tethered. And it's not like, you know, it's almost in a very selfless way because I don't, it's not about me. It's not about my idea. I'm actually, as soon as I'm tethered to an idea, I look to collect people uh, mm. because it can't be just me. I, I will never mm -hmm. be successful. So, so I, that it's that collaboration and we're all chasing. And it's the reason why I called my family office Dela, right? It's about dreaming yeah. alongside your loved ones. So I actually think that collaboration, you know, is makes me a better person, but it makes other people around me better uh, because it gives us purpose and we're chasing something. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to, about being a musician and about being a filmmaker is that connection you have with other people. So like, for example, I sit down and I say, I'm going to write a song. And I always write songs from either what breaks my heart or from what is bringing me incredible joy. And I, I sit down and I go, you know, like, you, like, you know, my father just passed away. So I'm sitting here thinking, like, I really want to write this song about my dad. And then I go and I work with somebody else. And there was a long time in my music writing career where I thought, if I am going to share this songwriting process with somebody else, it's going to make it less personal to me because it's not just going to be about my feelings. But as I, as I grew as an artist, I, I learned that you actually get more from it. I actually get more from it when I sit down and I write a song about my dad with another writer who, who says, you know, I, I've had similar feelings or I had feelings in a different way that can maybe give you some perspective on your experience. Do you find the same thing when you're collaborating with people that it just, that the magic really starts to roll over and what you first thought was your great idea, you really realize is maybe just one little small part of it, but there's 10 other people who came yeah. to the table with other incredible things. Yeah, so there's there's a chapter in the book called Royals, Rebels, and Randoms, and that's how we look to involve people in our businesses. And, you know, I love the randoms, right? Because randoms make the the engine go. They are the ones that are doing, that need the company and the purpose of the company, or in your case, the song, as much as, you know, the company needs them. And yeah. when you when you find those people, they insert their passion into it. And it's just like what you said about writing a song. I mean, um, there's a lot of people that feel like you feel, in fact, they're the people that are buying your albums, right? Because they want to hear something. But there's also a lot of people that are going through what you're going through, right? And they, they could have a voice, right? And together your voice could be even more powerful. You know, you remind me a whole hell of a lot of a good friend of mine, Zach Brown, who I speak about mm -hmm. this stuff all the time. And I think what makes yeah. his music so great as well is that it just, they're stories. You guys at the end of the day are storytellers. You come to the House of Crook here, 
and, and you talk to people, you, you forget that we sell a beverage because it's not about that. It's a bigger story. It's about being a marker, a black sheep, you know, thinking differently and not being penned in with the crook. That's what the name crook and marker. And not to make this a selfless, you know, promote for my business. But you know, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, I want to take people on a journey that's bigger than beverage. Because at the end of the day, if you just remind me I'm in beverage, I, I kind of like, you know, it's time to retire. So you often need to tap into other people's emotion along that, that journey because they're all drawn to the same thing. And I've had, you know, listen, I've had some good ideas, but I've also um, listened to a lot of good ideas and probably done more with those ideas than the people who could actually have them. Yeah. And that's the role you play and I play as artists. And I just feel like I'm an artist here. I'm just drawing something here. So I need to take things out of people's people's heads and make them reality because a lot of times they can't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. With Crook and Marker, you know, uh, why are you doing, um, I, I guess, I guess the way, what I'm trying to say is uh, with, with buy you identified that there needed to be soft drinks that weren't loaded with tons of sugar and with Crook and Marker, you're doing the same thing in a, in a way with alcohol. Talk to me about it. Well, you know, I kind of followed this consumer. They always say that I'm a disruptor. The reality is this millennial consumer is very disruptive and they're mm -hmm. big, 80 million strong. And we helped kind of shape their drinking habits on the non-alk side mm -hmm. um, because they were just done with sugar and yeah. didn't want to consume those calories. And we just gave them the vehicle to do that. That's an oversimplification of it, but it was at the expense of a big behemoth in soda. So you had all this share of stomach coming out of soda and a consumer that was just looking for a alternative and we were able to accomplish it. But we also developed a relationship with them. And then in 2017, Michael, something very unique happened. They all turned 21. The whole demographic became yeah. of legal drinking age. So what they did was they just took their drinking habits and they applied it to beer. And they said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to drink the carbs and the calories anymore. I don't want, I want an alternative. And then you saw the growth of seltzer in alcohol and it's a huge category It saved the beer, the beer category. And I just, I just understood what was happening, which was seltzer is just a sign of things to come because people will leave hard seltzers as quickly as they ran to it. It's just a safe place to go because it's not beer. And quite frankly, it's not much, it's kind of bland. And that to me was a signal that there needs to be a, a, a solution beyond seltzer. And I saw, I, quite frankly, I saw a great opportunity to continue disruption in beverage because the beverage industry is broken. And I, I, like, I like being around it because I feel like I could do my part in fixing it. And in this case, you know, we had an opportunity to create an alcohol that was made from these organic ancient grains that was USDA certified uh, organic uh, that had big bold flavor with that you can trust and that's really the answer beyond seltzer and then you know you get into it where there's all this growth in a category that is distracting it you know for good reason distributors from thinking about anything else except selling a lot of seltzer because it's saving their business and i'm kind of knocking on the door I'm like be careful don't don't get too comfortable with seltzer we have the answer and they're like okay <laughs> and, and I got that. And for the first year or two, it was a lot of like just resistance in what we were doing, yet we were growing a business that, that was substantial. So it just gave me really, really, although when I talk about taking those vitals of the business, well, the vitals in this one were strong. Now, there's a lot of ignorance that stands in front of what a consumer wants and what they get. And, and that's why I'm in business, right? I, I'm actually carrying a coin right now. I carry it all the time says a posse ad essay, which means from potential to being. And on the other side, it says virtus marcets in adversario, which is virtuous feeble without an adversary. So when I go to work every day, I really don't even think about the customer anymore. I think about everything that stands in the way of getting the customer what they really want. And I'm very confident that the product is what they want. So it's about retailers, it's about distributors, it's about big business, it's about commerce and everything that stands in the way of just giving people what they want, a better option. And I'm really good in that environment because it kind of gives me my edge because I get angry, right? So I'm like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to go toe to toe here. And, you know, that takes, obviously it takes money. It takes time. It takes persistence. It takes a good product. 
And then on top of all that, it takes luck. You got to have a lot of luck. You know, I could miss the window here and just, yeah. you know, and I go to, you know, where I could be on a beach. Uh, I go to work every day, you know, a little, with a little edge, a little anger, you know, and I'm in the same neighborhood, almost the same building I was with Vi. And I'm happy and I like doing that. And I guess that, that fight that I refer to just gives me purpose. And, yeah. um, and to see the little wins, like we're getting, we're collecting some really good wins. And I just, it keeps me tethered to the big dream. And I'm just more excited about it today than even when we started. When you, th- you know, uh, start with a beverage, do you see it in your head? Do you see the whole thing? Like you actually see the bottle, you see it on the shelf, you see somebody picking it up. Cause to me, I'm not a beverage person. So if I'm thinking of a beverage, it's really hard for me to see the the face of it, you know, like, what is it? What does the bottle mm-hmm. look like? What is the, the graphics? Look like, how do you, how does that come to be? Do you- I do see all that. And it's not always a hundred percent clear, but I do see that, but it's a small part of a bigger vision that I see. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of entrepreneurs get caught up on making it look good, taste good, perfect placement of every, you know, uh, every component of the label and, and chase perfection in the can. I mean, we do all that to an extent, but I'm the kind of guy that that sees that, uh, 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 be, you know, with in front of a, of a a landscape of something much bigger. And I think that's important because if you don't have that bigger perspective, then you're you're almost you're blind to where you're going. And I don't know how you can ever take money from people without a plan. And you can't really have a plan without a vision. Like I always start here and I work my way back to the product, right? So for me, you know, the reason with Kirk and Marker, I saw 80 million people that I know don't want beer, that I know are sacrificing. And then as a result, I can say, okay, what is the value of the category behind beer? And I spent some time trying to figure out with logic, what is that worth? And is it worth the next nine years of my life changing? Is it worth whoever's gonna put money into this? Is it worth putting in capital? Is it worth convincing other people to quit whatever they're doing and join this? And I create, I have a stronger vision for that than even the product. That's why I'm more confident in the product because we've done this before and I know the consumer. So I, on specifically on this venture, I'm more focused on the opportunity. And I think that's a, a lesson that I try to impart on a lot of entrepreneurs, which is, it's great. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, version of a espresso martini. And so you feel like the world needs that in a can. Okay. Now convince me why and how big and how long is it going to take you to get there? What is the opportunity? Why would you disrupt somebody enough to sell, to have them buy it? And, you know, how are you going to pay people back? I mean, it's not what they want to hear uh, yeah. because it's so easy just to dream about, hey, wouldn't it be great to crack open an espresso martini with a friend and share it? But that journey, yes, it requires that belief in it, right? And it requires you obsessing over the product so it tastes great and it looks as good as it can look. But it's really, you know, it wins or loses based on your plan. Yeah. And and my plans are never perfect. And I always, like I thought buy would sell for three and a half billion dollars when I started, <laughs> did it. Uh, but, you know, I had a plan. And in, in having a plan and, and listening to the brand and the consumer early on, I was able to succeed by failing, right? I think that... Uh what you guys are doing actually is changing the world and it's changing the way that people think about their health. It's changing the way that people think about their, um, their beverage consumption is drinking calories. But I think that where you guys are winning the most is, uh, is that you're like what you're described before people are sacrificing by drinking beer. People aren't sacrificing by, by drinking, by, um, by drinking crook and marker. Um, What's, is there, is there something after this that you've already yeah. thinking about? Uh, or is there like. And product wise, yes and no. Like I said, I get all consumed with, with what I'm doing in part that probably does soften my voice elsewhere because I'm very focused 
on, on this. But when I say this, you know, even when you say beverage, I, I do kind of in my mind roll my eyes. And I have all the respect and I love the industry in which I'm in. I think mm -hmm. consuming a beverage is a personal thing and, and it's done on, uh, you know, more often than, than eating, you're, you're drinking. So I think that being responsible there is important. And I love the impact that I've had alongside some great people in shaping those, those uh, attitudes towards it. Um, but really, what I want as a legacy is I want people like in the name Crook and Marker, I want people to kind of be unbound in how they think. Um, be a standout, stand up, stand up to, you know, big, big business and in my case, big soda and big industry um, and, and do it for all the right reasons. And, and don't be afraid to fail as you're doing it. And I think when you get intimate with the brand, you kind of peel back the layers that speak to the beverage and you realize there's a bigger brand there. I would love on the heels of Crooked Marker to really, and, and Crooked Marker is doing a better job of it than buying because we had a very similar culture, but I've literally put in the name here. And my goal here is to ultimately become bigger than beverage. That doesn't mean I'm politically motivated. I'm not looking for, you know, to run for office or anything like that, but I do feel like I have a voice that resonates at times with people. And I think I have a practicality to what I say uh, without a bias. And I think that, you know, in imparting that on people has been very gratifying to me. Um, watching people become great because of, you know, certain mentalities that I've applied to business and they can apply to business or beyond business. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, once you turn 50, you start thinking about, you know, <laughs> what's the bigger calling? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and now, you know, like I said, Crook and Marker, it's like raising another child. So it is all consuming, but I am doing it with this sense of what is next. So I do think about that more than I ever did. Yeah. I got one last question for you. And it's a question I ask everybody who's on this podcast, which is, what does it mean to you to be human? And how do you stay that way? How do you, how do you stay human? Well, this is being human is having a conversation like this and being challenged. You know, I think in a way you're challenging me to think bigger. And, and I appreciate that because I don't spend a lot of time challenging myself for that. And that's a part of being human to me is understand, just like you said earlier, you know, sometimes you don't write the best song. Sometimes the guy next to you had a better idea. And that's very human of you to say that because in a way you're saying you're showing your vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So for me, staying human is about showing vulnerability and understanding that, you know, every interaction you have, there's a learning there and you don't have all the answers. Often those people will put in your, in front of you, in your presence to maybe influence you in that way or guide you and, and staying open to the fact that you're not perfect, I think makes you human. Mm. Man, it's been awesome to talk to you. And uh, I'm super inspired. I love what you do. And like, like I told you before, I, I was an early adopter of Buy, man. <laughs> I remember the very first time that it came onto our tour bus. And, and we we're everybody on the bus, I was like, you got to try this shit, man. And they were <laughs> drinking. And then I go, look how many calories in there. And uh, it, it quickly replaced, uh, you know, a lot of soda on our bus. So I just want to thank you for making our band healthier in that way. And, and just creating great options. And as my wife would also like to thank you, making great cocktails. With <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I want, first of all, thank you for that. I'm just a guy who makes drinks. I've had some success at it, but uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to have a conversation with me. And yeah, for me, it's about collecting good people in your life. And whether you know them for 30 minutes or you've known them for 10 years, um, you could connect with people who are like-minded and think the way you think, uh, not just about the product or the business you're in, but about life. So I appreciate the conversation. I hope we could have more of them. Uh, sure, and uh, I really enjoyed meeting you. Right on. Likewise. Yeah, folks, uh, thanks for tuning into this week's uh, Stay Human podcast with Ben Weiss. And we want to give thanks to uh, Gibson Guitars for sponsoring the show. 
And uh, we'll be back next week with another awesome guest. But in the meantime, go out and have some bye. Have a crooked marker on me. And uh, I'll be toasting you from wherever we're, we're sharing this. All right. Peace, Ben. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye.